What's up, everybody? I'm doing the next episode of Fight Quest Stories. This one is Penjaxilat in Indonesia. The reason I'm doing them kind of back to back and I'm doing more of them, is I, as I mentioned, I have hip surgery coming up and I don't know how long I'll be laid out and how much I can do. So I kind of want to get them out of the way before uh, October 4th when I get my hip, I get a new hip. So uh, a few people asked why South Korea was so much shorter than the rest of them. Not a lot happened off camera. In South Korea. Now, this is a behind-the-scenes thing. I don't really recount everything you guys saw. I recount the things you guys didn't see, mostly. And in South Korea, there wasn't a lot that was off-camera. What you saw was what you got. I trained Hapkido. I did Hapkido. Um, I was up in the mountains. So, before and after shooting, there just wasn't a lot going on. I really enjoyed the food and the, and the camaraderie and the, the, the nature setting. It was a lot of fun. But there wasn't a lot going on that you as an audience didn't see. So great people loved them. Not a lot going on, on uh, you know, uh, off camera for that one. So that's why South Korea was a little bit shorter. Um, Penjak Salat in Indonesia. I had no idea what I was getting into for Penjak Salat. I don't think I'd ever heard of it. I had certainly never trained it. Never been to Indonesia. So where where we went to start it off was Jakarta, and Jakarta is a big city in Indonesia, and. I love Indonesian food. I had had experience with it in LA and love Indonesian food. The food there was awesome. It's a Muslim country and city, but it isn't so strict that you couldn't get beer, that the, the, the crew could drink and stuff like that. So it's a Muslim country, but it's not super duper strict. Um, so a Westerner can, can do a lot of fun stuff and, and it really wasn't that big of a deal. But a modern city, really cool. Got my first experience with durian fruit, if you've ever had that. It makes Doug vomit, like, on cue. Doug can't smell that stuff without getting sick. So, of course, I would chase him around with durian fruit. Uh, durian fruit is this big fruit, and it's, it ferments. The, the fruit itself ferments in its shell, kind of. It has kind of this hard outer thing. And it r ferments in there. And so it has this really strong, pungent smell. It's almost like... Horseradish, if you put horseradish on your tongue and it fills your sinuses up, you know, you get wasabi and that's how durian fruit is. You just taste it and it goes all the way through your sinuses and it's super duper strong. So there are people who love durian fruit and hate durian fruit. There is no middle ground. It's almost impossible to, ah, oh, durian's okay because it's just so strong. And it's like, you know, people don't like garlic, hate garlic because it's just, you can't get away from it. I'm Greek. I love garlic. But durian fruit's like that. So that's actually a funny story. We got exposed to durian fruit, and Doug was like, what the fuck is that smell? And I'm like, it's this fruit thing. They make ice cream out of it. They do everything with durian fruit. And Doug can't stand it. I, it it's too strong for me. I don't like it. But I don't react like Doug did. Doug can't even, like, be near it. So there, literally there was a video of me chasing him around because – Durian fruit, I mean, if I do this, you, the whole room stinks of durian fruit. And so I would chase him around with it. I was chasing him around one of the production trucks or something, something on the street. I was chasing him around with durian fruit. And Doug was like gagging like he can't stand being near it. So that was interesting. Uh, Doug found out that he can't stand durian fruit. But it's kind of everywhere. So, yeah, there were the, there were the food things and, and getting to know the culture and all that stuff. It was a lot of fun. So one of the things we did when we were in... While we were in Jakarta, we went to a a mosque. We were near a mosque do, do, uh, during something during the day. If you've ever been to a Muslim country, when the calls to prayer go out, everybody kind of stops what they're doing and prays. So we were at we were near a mosque and we're outside the mosque, but people are lined up on the street to to pray. They just stop what they're doing and you know people were spilling out of the mosque. And so I'm watching this, and a bunch of kids are around. So they had stopped praying, whatever, all, a bunch of kids are around. And they're all crowding around us. Because much like the Philippines, even the small crew we had in Jakarta was a big deal in Jakarta. They just don't film that much stuff. So we kind of attracted more attention than we would in, in the West or in, a, in, a, in certainly in the United States. And all these kids are around. A school had just gotten out or something. And they start saying this name and staring at me and pointing. And they all start chanting it. And I was like, I turned to my camera person. I go, what the hell are they doing? And our fixer with our translator goes, oh, they think you're Zidane. They were all saying Zidane, Zidane, Zidane. And I go, at the time, I was like, who the hell is Zidane? He was a French football player. He's the guy who headbutted the guy in the World Cup and got ejected years ago. And he's just a bald white guy. 
And they assume, because I have a camera on me, I must be famous, so I must be Zidane. And all these kids start start started thinking I was Zidane. They're all soccer fans. And just, like, went nuts. And that's kind of, if you saw the, <laughs> the Philippines episode, stuff like that happened to me all the time when we were filming because they just assume you're famous, so they assume you're somebody you're not. And, uh, yeah, so a bunch of kids in Jakarta thought I was Zidane. So um, my coach, when, when we... Obviously, we, in Jakarta, we met our, our masters, our instructors. Um, my Mine was Rita Sawanda. Uh, she was the, the first female, I think the only female coach I had on Fight Quest. I think she was the only one, but I um, met her, went up to the mountains with her and her, her team, or like three or four people from her school. So we get up there, once again, beautiful. We're in the middle of the jungle. The conditions were tough for sleeping because they didn't have like rooms up there. They had some kind of, they had a, 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 a house of some kind, but it didn't have any furniture. So we slept on the floor in a sleeping bag. And so I didn't sleep well at all. And I was sore all the time because it was a hard floor. And we just, you know, I'm training hard and I would sleep on this. So we ran into some early challenges very, very quickly. What happened was, the first, one of the first things I remember doing, we got up there and a lot of it came from my producer. And, and there, there was a producer for every episode. But as we split up into groups, into two groups, each one, our camera person was really our producer, our shooter producer. So there was one producer of the episode. But when you went off, usually the person in the country uh, got, didn't get the producer producer. That producer stayed in the city just because they could have the communications to talk back to, to New York and all that stuff. So... The producer producer usually stayed in the city. But if you went off to the country, your shooter, the person holding the camera, was your producer. That was a guy named Jonathan Fermansky. And we worked together on a lot of episodes. Really liked the guy. Um, he ended up filming the Amy Schumer show. Inside Amy Schumer. I saw him on camera a couple times. And I was watching Amy Schumer and they had a thing called Fermansky beer. That was a joke because for Jonathan Fermansky. I was like, oh, Fermansky, that's, he must be shooting that. And he was. He was a, he was a producer there. So anyway, a uh, little side note there. But it's a guy named Jonathan Fermansky. And we were out, in, and so he, he and I, because of the issues we, we ended up dealing with in Indonesia, ended up collaborating a lot on how to kind of make this work. So here's one of the things, the first tip off, we had a problem. Um, they had me run up the mountain, because obviously it's beautiful jungle and all this stuff, these mountain trails. It's okay, and Jonathan says, okay, let's get a shot of you, you know, doing some, some road work up these mountains. I said, yeah, sure, no problem. So me and the rest of the crew... Now, I don't mean crew, the shooting crew. Me and the, the, the team, the rest of the, the martial artists who went with Rita up there, they're like, okay, we're going to run up the mountain. They're like, all right. We start running. with some kind of loop. I forget how it worked. But I start running, you know, and at the time I was in pretty good shape and I, you know, didn't have a hip problem yet. So I'm running and I come back down the loop and the guys I started with, remember, I went past them. I, I didn't see where they were behind me. I get, I get, back, I get back to this loop or whatever and they're sitting there smoking. They had basically run past the camera, far enough to get away from the camera first, and they just sit down and start smoking. Fuck. That's a bad sign because these are the people I'm training with. And they were in terrible shape. Just terrible shape. They 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 weren't really they were almost like, oh, we're gonna do this thing, okay, whatever. They they they, they weren't it wasn't I mean Korea, the one I just shot. Those guys were in good shape. They knew their hap keto. They, they were excited to do it. We had fun. They could teach me a lot of stuff. Everywhere I went, all the teams I had trained with were motivated and they were good at it. And these guys were just like, like I don't know, like like their mom had forced them to go and they, they didn't want to. And, and so every time we do anything, they, they weren't really a part of it. I didn't have a team of people. And the way Rita taught at the time, she would teach a little bit of stuff and do like one thing and then go, okay, we're done. And Fermansky, my shooter, would go, no, we need more footage of him doing stuff. And she'd go, no, we're done. And so he and I would look at each other like, Fuck, you need a lot of footage to make a show like this work. You get hours and hours of stuff for them to do B-roll and to, get, you know, we don't know which way we're going to go. So you need the footage of, of everything you can. And she would teach something and then go, OK, we're done. We're finished. And she wouldn't push me that hard. She, so we had no footage of me getting pushed hard. I was in better shape than everybody around me. Um... And there just wasn't enough training footage. So for Mansky and I would sit there and go, okay, let's do X, Y, and Z. Let's, you know, like there was all this beautiful footage, like, you know, climb this tree and, you know, like do pull-ups on this tree, like 20 feet up or whatever it was to get something visually interesting to fill up time. Cause we're like, 
she doesn't want to train me or she she just doesn't she she trains me briefly and then she kind of stops and we had trouble with that and then i couldn't in in other um you know like mexico city which is coming up um i didn't get a lot of time with nacho Berestain, but vicente escobedo who was my guy there you know who was training with me trained me a lot and it would be me and him we didn't even have like the the you know the second in command to show me some stuff Really didn't show that much, and the team the team couldn't keep up with. They couldn't go for more than a couple minutes, and they'd run out of gas. When I would spar with them, we'd move around a little bit, and they'd just be done. They couldn't do anything. I was like, "Ah, oh, shit, what am I gonna do?" You know. So they ended up bringing in this ringer uh, from another school. She he knew Rita somehow, or it was one of her students, but he was from a different school. He came in, and we sparred, and he could actually bang, and he had decent cardio, and he had good technique. So we were like, "Oh, thank God." We got some footage of us sparring. That worked. Uh, and he showed me some good stuff. I think he spoke and he spoke English as well. So we had a little bit of a bridge there. Rita didn't speak English. She spoke very little. So that was a problem too. Rita didn't speak enough English for us to have, for, for her to explain what was going on. We, we, we had a translator, but that can be tough in terms of, of the, 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 uh, the back and forth on camera. It was tough because she didn't speak English. And if you have a translator in the middle, they, they don't like that. So... For production purposes. So, anyway, that was an issue. So, one time, an example of what we're trying to do. We're just trying to get her to push me harder. We were trying to get her to push me harder. So, there's a scene where I'm getting hit with, with like this bundle of sticks that are all tied together. And she's saying, too slow. No matter what I do, she's saying, too slow. She's having me do these drills. She's saying, too slow, too slow. And she's hitting me with them. I don't know if you can see it on camera. I'm trying not to laugh. Because... Fermansky had made this thing. He had tied this to us. She didn't do it. And he handed it to her and he said, hit him and say too slow no matter what he does. She didn't know what too slow meant. So she didn't know what she was saying. And I knew that because I had seen Fermansky give it to her. Like it, was, it wasn't behind my back. He'd go and say, hey, look, we need to do something here. Hit him with this and tell him too slow. She goes, too slow? And she goes, he goes, yeah, too slow, too slow. Just say too slow. So when she's hitting me saying too slow as I'm doing sit-ups and all that stuff, she, she might as well be saying Bigfoot spectacles. She had no idea what she was saying. So I'm like trying not to laugh because she has no context. She doesn't know what means I'm going too slow. She doesn't know that. She's just saying too slow, too slow. She doesn't know what that means. So I'm laughing my ass off and I'm trying not to show it on camera because I'm doing these exercises. And she, in her mind, is just yelling gibberish at me and hitting me with sticks. And I thought it was hilarious. And remember, she didn't make the read bundle. That's not normally her thing. Fermansky made it for her. So the good part was this stuff wasn't like behind my back. Like Fermansky was saying, like, look, we need stuff to make this back. So, okay, cool. Do whatever you got to do and let's do this, this, and that. So I was part of the process a bit more. And I've talked about it and I'll talk about it in the future about not being part of the process where things would get sprung on you that involved your health and your welfare. And, and this wasn't one of those times. Fermansky was saying we need to do this and I was, I was totally involved in everything. Oh, I got to turn on this light. So anyway... That was a big part of, of, of this whole shoot was um, us trying, uh, collaborating, trying to make things more interesting or get something visual or whatever. So the style itself, Pinjoxilat, had some good kicks. It was almost like Taekwondo with the kicks. And then you could catch a kick and throw the other person. But in the middle, they would do this kind of dance stuff. So it was, it was almost like... Um, you know, like, like like Bruce Lee would throw a kick and then he'd, he'd do some kind of f like form, kind of. That was the silat part of Penjax. And she kept saying, dance silat, dance silat, which means hit the guy and then make this kind of mo like this oh, kind of motion, right? With the arms. So it, she would always say that. Whenever she would yell, silat, silat, she's saying, do the dance too. Don't just kick or hit the person. Which was a tough concept for me because, you know, I'm out there to hit somebody, I'm out there to hit them. I don't dance in the middle. So. But Silat is like this arm motion and body motion that they do in between the strikes. So, okay, I'm trying to learn the Silat side. The, the kicks were legit, and then you know, they have some kicks and trips, almost like a Muay Thai, when you, kick, when you catch a, a leg and, and trip the guy. Because uh, they didn't grapple at all. You couldn't take the guy down and submit him, but you could grab the leg and just throw him, and that was worth points. They did weapon stuff. I don't think, we didn't do a whole lot of that. The problem with weapon stuff, obviously, in Fight Quest is we're not going to have a knife fight on television. So we might train weapon stuff because it visually looks cool. 
But there's only so much we can do with it because we can't have a knife fight or a sword fight on television. So we can demonstrate it. It made good demonstration stuff. Um, but you couldn't do much with it. The Phil- in, in the Philippines episode, obviously, when they, they, they made the uh, knife with like a mark on it and we, we did kind of a knife fight with the mark, that was, that was cool. But in other styles, Penjoxalot included, whenever we did knife stuff, we weren't quite sure how to integrate that. And we had already done that in the Philippines, you know, mark each other with a knife. So we couldn't really use it much. So we went to a volcano uh, in, uh, in, in the mountains up where I was. And so we went to this volcano and they had all these prayer beads that were really cool. And I bought um, a pair of them, these beautiful prayer beads made out of the, the, the rock that came from the volcano. So it's really shiny, beautiful necklaces. And so anyway, so we're up there and they said, okay, we're going to do some knife, obviously dull, not real knives, but like dull knives, some forms with a knife. So some knife fighting stuff on this volcano, this beautiful background. So what happened was there were these canyons of gas in between these ridges. And in these canyons was the gas runoff, <clears throat> the gas runoff from the volcano. So the gas coming down is, he- is heavier than air. So it was literally like like a, a waterfall or like a river of gas, meaning it didn't rise up. If you fell in there and you breathe that stuff, you could only breathe it a few times before you pass out and you die. So we're on these, these rock formations that are pretty much... There are a lot of them are sand, or not sand, but like small rocks. And then in between are these valleys of poison gas. So we're doing our thing, and our um, uh, Fermansky, the shooter, goes, there, there was like a park, because it was like a, you know, a national park or whatever. So there was like this uh, uh, park ranger there. And there was this chain that said, don't go past here. You know, fatal poison gas, do not pass. And Fermansky went, oh, you know, can we just go over there? Like, just right, there were these ridges that looked cooler than the ones we were on. He said, can we just go past that, just right there? And the park ranger goes, yeah, sure, go ahead. Yeah, fine. Right past this thing that says, do not pass poison gas. So we go to this other ridge, and Fermansky goes, you know what, guys, can we, can we go over there? Just one. And the park ranger kept letting, him, letting us go. And then after the third one, I look, and we're like 100 yards past, do not pass poison gas under any circumstances. I'm like, great, wonderful. So we're on these ridges, and doing this knife stuff above these essentially rivers of poison gas. <laughs> so you got some great stuff. And every time I would slip or fall, there was this extra drama of, I could fall in there and die. Um, realistically, they would have fished me out before I died. So it, it lent some drama to it. But I just remember from Nancy just going back and back and back. And pretty soon we were like way past where we were supposed to go. And the park ranger was like, hey, have a good one. Like that would never happen in the United States. It was really funny. But... We did some stuff in front of the volcano. Really, really beautiful. Really fun. Um, saw monkeys for the first time in the wild in Indonesia. Never seen wild monkeys before. So, really, really beautiful. Again, I did the training. We had to, once again, do a lot of stuff to kind of fill in the gaps of the training. Because she didn't like to train that long. And, and the people I was with weren't great training partners. But I did learn some of the kicks. I did get a sense of the style. I did get some sense of what I was what I was in for in a final fight. So we do all this stuff out in the jungle. Had a great time with that. We head back to Jakarta. I meet Doug. Doug's training in the city. So I walk up and I, and they, they always had kind of a thing when Doug and I first meet. And I knew from the way they were keeping us apart, something was wrong or, or there was a surprise because they wouldn't let me see Doug. And they were making sure like they're wiring me up like, Oh no, make sure Doug's over. And I was like, Usually, Doug and I, they wanted us to meet, and, and that would be kind of an event. But, you know, there wasn't that much to it, generally speaking. You know, we'd catch up and stuff, but there's no problem. There's no reason I wouldn't want to see Doug, you know? And so I got a little hint somehow. I remember that, that some, they wanted me to see something and be surprised. That usually meant an injury to Doug, and that's not good. So I walk up, and Doug's, I look down, Doug's limping. And I look down, and Doug's foot looked like a loaf of bread. It was all like the, the ass end of, a, of, you know, the bad piece of, of bread. It was all lumpy and it was purple. And I go, what the fuck's wrong with your foot? And the producer goes, oh, we're going to do a walk and talk. 
a walk and talk is what it sounds like. Anytime Doug and I were walking and talking and they would, you know, be ahead of us with a camera, that's called a walk and talk where we're, 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 we're walking, to, walking and talking, obviously. And, and the producer goes, all right, you're going to have a walk and talk and talk about it. And I turn to the producer and I go, he shouldn't be walking at all. What the fuck's wrong with his foot? It was like they wanted us to, to not talk about it off camera. They wanted us to review. And I, and I went, whoa, 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 time out, dude. This isn't, like I've said before about previous episodes, this is not a joke. Like, this is not a, a plot point. His foot's fucked up. What bothered me the most about it w- wasn't just the shape, which was bad. The color was disturbing. And and it, it, I thought it was infected. I was like, it was like a dark purple and it looked really bad. And I said, dude, he's there could be an infection in there. Well, you know, what's wrong with him? So I kind of got into it with the producer because he was like, you know what I'm talking about? I said, what's wrong with his foot? He shouldn't, he shouldn't be walking on his foot, you know? You don't know what's wrong with it. We shouldn't be walking and talking like he should be in a fucking hospital getting this checked out. And me and the producer start arguing. And then finally I did the walk and talk with Doug. And I found out what had happened was Doug was fighting a guy, sparring, one of his teammates. And he kicked the dude. And the dude kind of blocked with his elbow. And the top of his foot hit the guy's elbow. And he got a hematoma on top of his foot. This lump, little bruise. And which wasn't bad. He said, I was all right. You know, it's just a bad bruise. I'll be okay. They took him. I'm not joking. The producer thought it would be good to take him to a witch doctor. Not exaggerating. A witch, like a faith healer, like, uh, you know, it was crazy. Not a doctor, not a hospital. And the guy sat Doug down on the floor and Doug told me the whole story of what this guy looked like and where they were in this little room. And it was weird. And he said, he took my foot and he, the hematoma was up and he pushed the hematoma back into my foot. And so, remember, this wasn't, it wasn't immediate. I've seen people do that immediately you know, in, in Muay Thai when I've had, you know, uh, hematomas on my shin. Sometimes they'll press them back in as soon as they happen. Meaning the blood hasn't been sitting there for a long time. The blood had been sitting on top of his foot for a little bit. And the dude pushed it back into his foot. And Doug was like, it's the most agonizing thing I ever felt in my life. And what it did is it pushed all that blood that had been sitting there coagulating back into his foot. And it started swelling horribly and it was all mangled and purple by the time I saw him. And I was just furious that Doug was allowed to keep... Tra- and they didn't then take him to a doctor. Like, okay, we got our shot of the witch doctor or whatever. Now let's take him to the hospital and see what's wrong. They didn't do that. They never took him to a doctor. So I am freaking out because, remember, they think this is great television. Oh, Doug's got this injury. And what are we? I was like, you don't know. You have no idea what's wrong. I go, this could get septic. He could have a serious fucking problem, man. And it just didn't register. They were like, no, he'll have the final. And Doug, Doug's a tough dude. And it was like, no, I'm fine. And I was like, I felt like I was the one person going, this is not okay. This is not all right that you're hurting him like this with something that is, that is, and also, you got your shot. You got your footage of him having a fucked up foot. Now, take him to the doctor, get this thing drained, or whatever the fuck it is, or get him some antibiotics or something, and then we'll have the fight. And, I, I, you know, it, it seemed like Doug being hurt is in the fight is a great plot point. We should do that. Rather than, let's go to hospital, because they never did. They never did. They never, never took him to a doctor. We just, we just went to the fight the next day. And I was just, I was in a bad mood the whole time because of, because of that. And um, so that's what happened. And I was furious. And also, Doug was acting a little strange in Indonesia. He, what, Doug's a really happy-go-lucky kind of guy. He's really like, uh, he, he's the guy you see on television. He, he is a happy, he's a, he's a madman. He's, he's a happy-go-lucky madman. He does crazy stuff. He was a little weird in Indonesia. He was just he just wasn't himself. And the crew was like, Yeah, what do you think's wrong with Doug? And I go, Doug's getting beat up every week. Doug's getting beaten up every week. That isn't easy psychologically, that isn't easy physically, that isn't easy emotionally. And it's starting to wear him down a little bit. Guys, right before he has to fight with a, a lumped up foot, right? So I was told the crew, I go, dude, he's he's not doing well. You know, like, he's getting beat up every week. It's not fun. He's going through all this shit, and, you know, it sucks. And it just didn't, didn't register to them. Anyway, 
So, Doug decided he was going to fight. I thought that was a terrible idea. Simply because we had no diagnosis. We had no idea what was... A, a medical professional never took a look at his foot, so we didn't know what was wrong. And it, it looked worse every minute. So, the final fight's coming around. And Doug said, look, I've been doing well against my teammates here in Indonesia, in Jakarta. I, th- I think I'll be all right. I, it's, I, I've really been doing well here. My first thought was, my teammates weren't that good. If your teammates are the same level as my teammates, because I think the, the, the two coaches were husband and wife, I think, if I remember correctly. Um, so they were kind of related. And I went, in my head, I was like, well, my teammates weren't that good. I could beat my team, teammates up with one hand. If, you know, if Doug's beating up his teammates, that might not be a good indication of how much he's learned or, or um, how good his opponent will be. Okay? So that was in my head. was, all right, you're beating up these guys, but I could beat up my guys one-handed so ugh. so we set the final fight and it's kind of like taekwondo with with some throws in it but but we hit hard they, they gave us a chest protector and all this stuff so we, we could bang you couldn't i think you could only hit to the body though i don't think you could kick to the head if i remember correctly so it was almost like you know we we're going to the body and with these kicks and that was all we could do and you could throw the guy and there were like three judges so, we're getting ready to fight. Doug fought first. So, first off, I look across at our, at, our, at our opponents. They were the biggest Indonesians I had seen the whole time there. In Indonesia, I'm about a head taller than just about everybody. I, you know, I'm, I'm big. And I'm average height. I'm only 5'10". I'm not huge. And in Indonesia, I was bigger than most people. The, Doug's opponent was bigger than Doug. My opponent was bigger than me. And they're, they're putting the chest protector on Doug's opponent. And he's mad dogging Doug. Mad dogging him, dude. Just fucking staring at him. I was like, fuck. This dude's a real fighter. You could tell. I, I looked at his build. I looked at the way he was looking at Doug. And I was like, this dude's legit. This, this guy's not screwing around. This is legit. I don't, I don't know if Doug's prepared for this and Doug's injured. Fuck. And so the first two things that happened... I forget which order it happened. They went, go. And the dude jumped back and hit Doug with a spin kick right in the chest. Knocked him back about four feet. First thing the guy threw. Boom. So one of Doug's things before we started the fight was he goes, yeah, I've, got, I've gotten really good at catching the kicks and tripping guys. He couldn't have caught that kick. No way. No way. It's like trying to hit 105 mile per hour fastball. Wasn't going to happen. That dude just went, boom, and knocked Doug back. And I went, Oh, fuck. And then Doug threw a kick, and the dude caught it and kicked Doug's leg out from underneath him, and he did a spin in the air and dropped. Those were the first two things that happened. And I went, shit. Doug spent the next, I forget how long the, the, the fight was, five minutes, just getting beaten from pillar to post. That dude was legit. He was really good. And Doug was just not prepared. And Doug was hurt, so Doug couldn't really walk, and Doug couldn't put weight on his foot and all this stuff, and he just got beat up. He got beat up, and Doug was pretty upset at the end of the fight. And I, you know, I hugged him, told him I loved him, and and you know, dude, it's you're all right, man. He's like, all right, you fight now. And I was like, fuck, all right. And they started they started putting the chest protector on me, and the dudes across from me, and they're putting the chest protector on him, and he's mad dogging me. He's mad dogging me, and I just looked at him. And I was like, and he started laughing. He started. I, I brought. You know, he started, I was like, no, dude, you're not gonna. No, uh, uh-uh. uh, you're not gonna mad dog me, and I'm gonna fall apart. This isn't my first fucking rodeo, dude. Forget it, you know? And he just, and he started laughing. He couldn't keep a straight face. So that was like the, yeah, come on. Yeah, no, nah. Uh, so we started the fight. And the dude was legit. He could really fight. But I wasn't there to play around either. And, I, you know, I, 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 we were both going back and forth, landing good kicks. So what happened was there was like a, it was like a mat space. And we were surrounded by, it was, it was kind of like a little amphitheater kind of thing. Surrounded by the students and everything. So there wasn't a ton of room. So the cameraman, I don't remember who, was to my right. Because they had camera people with handhelds, and then they had a big jib camera that was moving around to show everything. And a cameraman was to my right. And I'm fighting this dude, and he knows I can't move to the right because there's a cameraman there. And so he starts circling to my left to kind of like box me in. And I turn to the camera guy and went, get the fuck out of my way. 
And the camera goes, oh my God. And he was, I was like, this is a real fight. It's, you know, I don't give a shit about the show right now. I don't care about you. I don't care about this camera. Get the fuck out of my way so this dude doesn't knock my head off. So we went back and forth, you know, fun stuff. I was catching his kicks. He was catching my kicks. And I was throwing, you know, we were both landing. So one time the dude does a big move and I, I bat down his foot and I move back and I hit the jib camera and it falls. These things are super duper expensive, by the way. This is like a big, that's my dog, Penny, by the way. Um, Penny, Penny, come. Good girl. So anyway, so the, the jib camera falls and it's hanging. I was like, oh shit. So I had to take a big break to get the camera back uh, on the jib. I, I ended up not permanently destroying the thing. I just broke the housing and it fell. So stuff like that kept happening. A cameraman got in my way. I, the camera fell down, all this stuff. I had a fun fight. It was really good. Um, the judges didn't score a lot of what I did. Uh, so, oh, he got the win. They raised his hand. Good deal. I shake his hand. So it was fun. But at the end, when we're doing like the final whatever walk and talk, which is, hey, here's what we learned kind of thing. Doug could barely move, man. He could barely move. He was not in good shape with his foot. And for some reason, I forget why, Doug and I, Doug had something to do in L.A. Maybe a doctor's appointment for that foot. They had sent him to a specialist or something. So we flew to L.A. together. And because Doug lived in on the East Coast and we're on the plane and Doug had to have his foot elevated the entire flight. And by the time we hit L.A., he couldn't walk at all by the time we got to L.A. So he went to the doctor and they said uh, that if it had gone a lot longer, if it had gone a couple more days, his foot might have been permanently damaged. Like they might have had to cut it off. Seriously, they said a few more days like this and you would have had a serious problem. It was basically a blood infection. The guy had pushed all this coagulated blood back into his foot and so it got an infection. And so he was laid up for the next two or three weeks. He couldn't put his foot on the ground. Like he had to have his foot over. couldn't do anything. Um, fortunately, there was, a, there was like a three-week gap between this episode and Mexico City, which is the next one. And Doug was able to keep his foot elevated the whole time and be okay. But it was fucked up. Fucked up. And he barely healed in time to get to Mexico City. But that's what happened in Indonesia. Had a lot of fun there. Um, at the end, of the, at the end, before our final shoot, I was in the hotel in Indonesia. And the call to prayer went out from all these buildings. And I was sitting on the balcony with the sound guy. And all the, the call to prayer went out. And all these bats came out of this cave and flew outside of our balcony. So all these... All this, this big call to prayers coming out. All these bats come around. We're like, it's pretty sweet. A lot of stuff like that happens. So anyway, that's Indonesia. That's why it's so long. A lot of stuff happened behind the scenes. Next one is my favorite, Mexico City. Uh, doing boxing with Nacho Beristain. That'll be coming up next. I'm coming up very soon because I want to get these done before my hip surgery starts. But enjoy. Let me know what you think. Later.